I'd like to welcome everyone, everyone who is joining us here live and everyone who is joining us via the recording to episode nine of Awakening Beyond Thought, an online interactive journey out of the blah, blah, blah of everyday life and into the simple strength of stillness. This ongoing web show is hosted by Gary Weber and Richard Doyle. We're very grateful to both of them for making the time to be here again tonight. And of course, grateful to everyone here, especially who's joining us live, who will be offering their questions into the mix here tonight. So it's a very exciting interactive session ahead of us. I'm gonna briefly introduce our hosts and then they will take it away. Professor Richard Doyle, AKA Mobius, is a liberal arts research professor at Penn State University where he has taught since 1994. He is the author of several books, including Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Newosphere. He was also a co-host on one of our former shows, Exploring the Soul of Nature, and Radio Free Vallis, which was a collaboration with Penn State University. He also has a new book based on a lot of the dialogues that we've been hearing here live with Gary, with Gary, and they both have that out, and that's online, and that is uh, based on this Awakening Beyond Thought journey that we're on. And we'll give you that website link so that you can download that. Gary Weber has done over 30,000 hours of meditation and yoga with various teachers in various disciplines and countries. He has a PhD in physical sciences and he's worked in military, national labs, industry and academia in R&D and management. He's also the author of several books, including Happiness Beyond Thought, A Practical Guide to Awakening and Dancing Beyond Thought, The Bhagavad Gita, Verses and Dialogues for Wake Awakening. So we're grateful, as I mentioned, to both of you gentlemen for being here again. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you guys for, uh, for this discussion. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. uh, really excited to be back after a month or so hiatus. Um, had to give the summer its due. But um, I thought we would um, start off tonight with a question. We, Gary and I received a couple of different questions online from people uh, who aren't able to dial in but um, and participate in the webinar, but the questions are of the sort that I think would be of uh, general interest. And then once they download the recording, they can also uh, hear our response. And uh, so uh, the uh, first question, I hope you'll uh, bear with me as I read it, because I think it's, uh, it's important to hear its phrasing because it's kind of beautifully written and you can you can feel where this person is uh, in the question. He said, I've recently become a father with the birth of my now two-week-old daughter, Gurdaya. She is, as you might expect, a joyous treasure. My wife and I have had the pleasure of being introduced to many new experiences, thoughts, and emotions over the past few weeks. As someone who attempts to observe and scrutinize myself with the aim of awakening, I've been trying to watch myself carefully as this new and profound relationship forms with my daughter. I wonder if you could offer some advice to a new parent. I feel this is a golden opportunity to observe how my ego perhaps shifts and reorients in response to this profound change in my life. How might I make the most of catching or investigating it as this apparently illusory construct looks to re redefine and reinforce itself? How can I make the best of this as an opportunity? Also, I wonder how I might help ensure that my relationship with my daughter is as healthy as possible, and perhaps attempt to catch and quash unhelpful attachments before they form. I've already observed myself flush with emotions and thoughts when gazing upon her. Rather than having to let go later, is there a way I can allow my love for her to blossom wisely without attachment? So I just thought that was really beautifully uh, put and uh, you know, really gets to the nub of a whole bunch of questions. So. I thought we would start off with it. Gary, did you want to uh, start with that? Uh, I mean, Gary and I uh, are, are both parents. So uh, I think one thing we'd probably be in accord with is that our best teachers have been our children and that they've been our teachers in this way that the questioner Jazz is suggesting actually is that it provides the opportunity for us to look and, and see who it is is becoming attached to these very powerful thoughts and emotions, right? My son is 15 years old now, so he's going through this tra wonderful transition into adulthood. And it's amazing 
to watch as my mind attempts to map out what that is going to be like, how that is going to be like, how that is going to be secured, and so on, you know, which college he's going to get into and so forth. But what's also amazing is, is that the, the, the practice of self-inquiry, of observing and seeing how those emotions flare up, actually allows that kind of mind construct to dissipate really rather quickly. And instead, I'm just kind of most of the time just there with the remarkable unfolding of a life that is my 15-year-old son or is my nine-year-old daughter. Because, And what's beautiful about that is that what's making the questioner gaze upon his daughter with these emotions is not going to go away. The power of that experience does not dissipate. I think that would be one of the fears that one might have about kind of uh, engaging in sort of non-dual parenting. But instead what occurs is that you just are entangled with their adventure in a way that doesn't allow you to be sort of separate from it and try to control it and try to map it and anticipate and prophesy. And my experience has been that that really enables that loving relationship that Jazz is asking about, that, that it's the other part that uh, really tries to organize the world. And in the face of like what is really for the cognitive mind and the egoic mind, a terrifying specter of total responsibility towards, you know, another being for the entirety of their lives, right? You know, the sheer number of things that would need to be controlled in order for the egoic mind to be satisfied there is just, you know, it's infinitesimal. And so it provides this opportunity for surrender because you can learn that it's just not possible to control this other being that is giving you so much uh, emotional joy. And it's in that experience of the surrender and feeling the impossibility of that control that really the growth occurs as a parent and also in this non-dual fashion. Gary, was there something you wanted to... Yeah, there's something else. There's been a, a lot of attempts made over the course of, especially the last 50, 75 years by non-dual people. You know, Jay Krishnamurti, for example, was one who looked at, could he develop a school or a series of schools that could somehow uh, have people be you know, non-dualistic almost from the very beginning? And that process didn't work. Uh, it doesn't work for a lot of reasons, but it's important to remember that this baby that you've got is really heavily uh, evolutionarily encoded to develop a subject, herself as a subject. And uh, she, she will watch. She watches the mom. She can see the mom first. Their eyesight's only able to focus about breast length to begin with. So mom is most important. And that goes along with time and develops. But she uh, is encoded to develop a subject object ability just to survive in her world. She has to learn what's important, who's important, and how that goes forward. So there's no point in trying to stop that uh, subject-object thing from forming it's going to form. Also keep in mind that she, when she was born, she probably had 400 billion neurons. Uh, there's a very quick pruning operation goes on, and a lot of those neurons are just thrown away. And she gets down to 100 billion. Uh, that's really so she can adapt to her new environment uh, to make sure she's perfectly suited for it. It's totally natural. So it's very important to get a lot of enrichment into the kids early so they can get their horizon straightened out and they can get a lot of exposure so they can map themselves out. Also, as Rich was talking about, about uh, Jackson going into uh, teenhood, it's important to remember that as they get up into teenhood that, in fact, uh, their emotional part uh, is way ahead of their intellectual part. Uh, there's a, I did a blog post on this thing. It's about 10 years offset between letting them develop their emotional maturity until the prefrontal cortex, the reasoning and control part, kicks in. 
So that's designed in. I mean, the crazy teen years are really evolutionarily designed in so the people, the, the folks get a chance to adapt to whatever their environment's going to be. And as you move around, if your child moves to a different city or something else, they will have a chance to adapt to meet that new environment, meeting new people, getting new horizons, going on to school. Uh, that's why we don't evolutionarily lock down that teen emotional thing until we're someplace into our 20s. Uh, early 20s for girls, late 20s for, for guys, they're a little slower, um, but that's how it's set up. And they won't be fully mature until they're in their mid-late 20s on purpose because they want to make sure you get this evolutionarily adaptable part worked in to fit your environment and then go on from there. Rich's point about uh, my biggest I think, learning out of all my time with my kids and now the grandkids is uh, you aren't in charge of them. I mean, you aren't responsible for everything that happens in their life. You can't be. Uh, they have many, many factors playing on them, especially as they go into school, into middle school, into high school, that you have no control over. So uh, let go, love them, support them, be available, be present for them. But uh, they're different people than what you are. And don't try to make them like you are. Let them be what they're going to be. They've got their own destiny, their own path and help and support them in that. And don't force them into some mold to fix what you thought went wrong with your childhood. One last thing I would add there that is amazing about being around developing human beings, which, you know, certainly doesn't stop uh, at the end of adulthood, but uh, is most obvious in children and uh, teens is that you experience the kind of sheer possibility of actual development, that, that you reflect on your own experience and you don't experience yourself as a static being. You experience yourself as a being capable of ongoing development. Now, I'm not going to grow, you know, four inches this year uh, in stature, but I can change and expand and alter at least that much in other dimensions. And it just, I know I have noticed that being around other developmental systems encourages you to entrain into development and to not think of yourself as done or finished or, you know, kaput. Well, it's the richest point about not being finished. This is a pitch for you. You need to keep, keep keep practicing. There's no end point. There's no enlightenment point. This is now off the kids onto us um, because we keep changing. Uh, you can map a monkey's uh, face map. I look at their brain. You can see how that's mapped out as to what their face actions are and what their sensations are and how they move their move their face muscles. That changes every week. Every week. Wow. And we are also neuroplastic, even even people like myself, old people, are neuroplastic. And if you stop learning, you atrophy. I mean, the brain is uh, conditioned to keep adapting, and you can adapt all the way up to the very end. So remember that there's no, I'm, I'm 35, so I'm not going to learn anything from here on out. If you do that, your brain will neuroplastically regress. It recognizes you aren't using it anymore. It's not learning anything new. It's not going to put any, any more effort into making new neural networks. So you're just going to start shutting networks down that you aren't using. So you are neuroplastic all the way through, and you need to keep learning. And if you're doing meditation, you need to keep practicing, maybe differently than you practiced before. Make sure you pick up new skills as you go along. You do not stop learning. If you stop learning, the brain says, okay, we're going to shut this place down then. So you need to keep active all the way through, and your kids as well. Cool. So uh, Gary had a question, too, uh, online that we wanted to start off with, and then hopefully people were uh, queuing their questions because it's what it, this, this whole domain lives off is questioning. Yeah, um, this guy's from a Canadian living in China, and he has one simple question. Well, you did say, uh, with a, uh, thank you for your help, yada, 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 yada. Listening to you and Rich conversing. Well, there have been very few times in my life where I listen to people talk. It hit me so exactly where I live that I found myself laughing, which had risen up in complete spontaneity. What a wonderful feeling. 
And his question is, in the midst of your now experience, does the observing speak out? Or is it simply a silent observing? This may be a really dumb question, but in the culling process and keeping an eye ear out for the observing, it might be a useful clue for me. I.e., if it is talking, then it isn't the silent, silent witness. So, yeah, that's really correct. I mean, if, if you're uh, quiet and silent and still, you shouldn't have self-referential problematic thoughts continuing. If you hear some buzzing over in the corner uh, and it's self-referential, yes, that can be gotten rid of as well. Uh, I've got a video out on uh, three different kinds of thoughts. There are different kinds of thoughts. There's the problematic self-referential uh, OMG type thoughts that we are clog up our brains with. Uh, Ninety some percent of our internal narrative is of that type. There's another part, another brain circuit, another kind of thought, which is really about planning and problem solving, which is not emotionally charged, not self-referential. You may use an I in it, like how do I get to the interstate? But uh, those kind of thoughts are fine. Uh, what we can do surgically by the process, this self, simple self-inquiry process, is we can take out the first category, the problematic, self-referential, emotionally charged thoughts, almost surgically remove that. Just keep persisting, surrender, inquiry, you can get rid of that. The other part, uh, you may find as you go along that in fact you won't do as much as you used to before when you're planning something. You won't verbalize to yourself the whole time you're going through a problem-solving problem process. You'll find you don't need that as much, but you might just have learned how to do that and are kind of acculturated and habituated into doing it that way, so you'll keep doing it. But you'd be surprised how little you even use that second category of thought where you say, okay, I just want to solve this simple problem. But yes, there are two different kinds. And the first kind, the problematic kind, you can get rid of those. And if they aren't gone, you've got some more work to do. Well, and you always have some more work to do but it becomes more and more joyful. And I, I would just add that, that I, I've noticed lately that when I get still, sometimes I, I notice that there's a voice going there and it is that planning voice. It's like, I wasn't even aware that there was this background process going where it's trying to plan out something and solve some problem. And there it is. And like, it's just going, but it as Gary says, it doesn't have the emotional inflection and, and attachment associated with it it's just trying out different variations well you know what if it went here what if it went there you know and and that that i never noticed that that was going on before because i had so much of the self-referential internal narrative thought going on but now that it's not really there so much i you know when i get still every now and then i notice that there's this channel going and it's doing this problem solving <laughs> channel well, and, and what, what it feels like to me, too, uh, when I'm writing something, and Rich is a very prolific writer, when you're writing something, you're trying out what the next line of the poem is. What's the missing word is in this? What's the right paragraph to stick in now? And there's, there's just counterplay going back and forth between the offline process, which is doing has all the capacity, all the data storage, all the fast high-speed processing. And it's the one that's doing the work on trying to come up with new alternatives, a better line for the poem, a better paragraph, a better way to phrase that last line. And it'll keep trying that. And it works on it for a while. And it says, hey, Louie and I came up with this one. Do you like this idea? And it goes back and forth. And no, I don't like that. It goes back down. And he and Louie work on the problem. And they come back up again with another solution. And you can get confused with that. That's okay, because there's nothing problematic about that. But if that turns into what the, am I going to do about this, this this line, this poem? I'm never going to get this correct. I've been working on this thing now for two weeks. I'm never going to get this line. Then that's the other kind. Yeah. You're over off into the, the first kind, which is problematic, self-referential, emotionally charged, and you can cut those out. You just watch that transition because it can be very fast, sneaking back and forth between simple planning and trying out and over sneak over into emotionally charged self-referential stuff, but just watch for it. So any questions that, that we've have popped up, Jennifer? Yes, we, we do have some questions. Um, going to read one from, let me just mute you while I read the question. I'm just getting a tiny bit of feedback. So we'll do that just to get that off. Okay, cool. Um, so I have a question from Raphael. 
And he asks, in regards to relationships and awakening, I have found myself struggling, surrendering to the prospect of losing my wonderful girlfriend and puppy. Is there something to be said about holding on to the infinite emotion of love which emanates from these relationships and not necessarily att attaching it to the relationship itself? I've never seen that work. Uh, I mean, it, it, they are attachments, and you might be surprised how um, more present you can be with your GF or with your puppy uh, if you get out of the way. Uh, in my experience is a much deeper, stronger, clearer, more honest relationship than what you may be when you're deeply attached to her or her behavior or the puppy and its behavior. Uh, it's a great place to learn, as we talked about in the first versus first question. You can see yourself getting attached. You can feel how the attachment works. And just try out for yourself, what if the puppy weren't here? What if the GF wasn't here? Uh, how would I feel? Because that's how much attached you are. And if you say, I couldn't possibly have my GF disappear, my girlfriend disappear, that's how much you're attached, and that's how much you may ultimately suffer if she does go away. And you will cling to that attachment tight, hard. And just watch that. If you can let go of that, see if you can let go of it little by little by little, and see if, in fact, the relationship stays the same, or if it even may grow richer, or it may go away. But I wouldn't try to hang on to attachment uh, or or non-duality. I, I didn't hang on to attachment. I just started to let them go. Some are, some go easier than others, but you will have to let go of them all. And uh, what's interesting, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, Jennifer, in the phrasing that there was an idea of holding on to the love as yes. opposed to the relationship. Hold, okay. Holding on to the infinite emotion of a love which emanates from these relationships right. and not necessarily attaching to the relationship itself. Right. Um, and, and I think that, you know, that's a step. That's a step to see that, in fact, the relationship is not really the locus of the love. But as soon as that holding on verb formation gets in there, as Gary points out, that's the attachment. I mean, it's almost as if holding on and love are antithetical to each other, actually. Love, the, the love that you're experiencing is the indication of the selfless state. Love is the dissolution of the boundary between self and other. That, that carefully crafted subject-object boundary that Gary talked about evolving and developing in the infant and in, you know, into the adult, we, experience, we can experience the dissolution of that boundary, and then we point to another being or a relationship and say, that's the cause of the loss of that boundary. And so then we want to locate the love onto something which cannot be done. And so as soon as we start to try to attach or, or, or link that love to something causal, rather than just accepting that that selfless state is, it exists. And the more we try to uh, make it emerge from this relationship or that puppy or this kind of chocolate, you know, not to trivialize it, but the more we try to put it into any kind of causal network whatsoever, where I can do something to make that love occur, the more the love actually retreats like mercury as you approach it. You know, when you try to grab a globule of mercury, it'll, it'll go away. Holding on to love or uh, uh, holding on and loving are oxymorons. There are contradictions in terms, and it can't happen. However, it does sound wonderful, Raphael, that you're seeing that the love is really not something that is just an attribute of this relationship. This relationship is an instance of something much larger. That may allow you to let go of the relationship, and in letting go of the relationship, actually experience love. And then, as Gary says, the girlfriend and the dog will either stay or they'll go, but either way, you'll know love. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, but I, but it, because we experience these, these emotions as the, the infinite, basically, as so tremendous, is that we want to know where we can store it <laughs> or what we can, 
you know, lo- where we could locate it in space and time. But it's not locatable in space and time. It's uh, uh, other people are just instances of it. They're not causes of it. Yeah, and it's, Richard mentioned chocolate. Mm-hmm. Not to trivialize what you're what you're talking about, but people say they love hand gliding, they love wingsuiting, they love surfing, they love bicycling, they love whatever. What they really love, they watch very carefully, is when they aren't there. Yeah. They find out that, in fact, with the hang gliding, the wingsuiting, the surfing, whatever, there's a point at which they may have a short period, maybe seconds, maybe a minute, where they aren't there. And they love that space. If you watch almost all of our avocations, they are that because we get away from blah, 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 blah. We get into this still simple, sweet space, this loving space. It's there all the time, as Rich was saying. It's always there. So, and we and we attach that to chocolate or wingsuiting or parasailing or whatever, or the girlfriend or the puppy, and we mistake the fact that those are the cause of this love. And actually, the real love is there all the time. We run after it in so many different ways. Rumi has a great poem about this thing. You know, it's just, that's what everybody is looking for: that stillness, that sweetness, that love that's there all the time. We just make a mistake by attaching it to the object that we think got us there. So any follow-ups from Raphael? Yes. Uh, he wrote in the chat, he quoted you, holding on and loving are antithetical, and commented profound. Thank you, guys. And Thank I you, Raphael. Good luck. Agree wholeheartedly. Thank you. And thank you for the question, Raphael. I have another question here. I'm going to go to from Ivan. And he asks... My question to Gary and Rich is, there is a lot of focus on thoughts and thinking in this path, but sometimes the sometimes it seems like the body and the emotions that are buried in it are somewhat overlooked. Can you comment on any practices that help to deal with those arising emotions in the body? Yeah, they're all coming from the same place. And what we, it's, it's not like thoughts are here and the body's over there or thoughts are here and the emotions are over there. I mean, the, the thoughts are the carry forward from what arises in the body. I mean, the, one of the great practices in non-duality is I am not this body, which is what I was doing when the page turned for me. You recognize that almost all of these thoughts, emotions, sensations are locked into our belief that we are this body. There is an eye that has this body, and that this body is who we are. And Rich and I and the Rimu Gita, which is all about recognizing, in fact, this belief that we are this body is the cause of all of our problems. And so the body is the source of all these emotions, all these sensations, all these difficulties, and all these attachments, and all the thoughts. And I was surprised once I re- unwrapped the I am I'm this body delusion that, in fact, that was the house of cards that was holding up the thought. They're all bundled together. There's not four or five discrete types of things. They're all tied together in one belief set. You can unwind them one at a time, or you can unpack them all one piece into the other, but they're all of a whole. So so does it make sense? Like, I, you know, th- this came to me just today. It's like, where does this weird premise that we are our bodies come from? Right? Because that, that's what it is. It's just a... It's an assumption that guides most of us through most of our lives. And it's such an obvious assumption. And our culture reinforces that assumption so much that we don't pause to investigate and observe. Well, what is the basis of that assumption? You know, you know, if my body is constantly changing, is there something in me that is unchanging that, doesn't appear to change and if there is something that is unchanging how can i possibly be my body right um or the you know fact that you know i observe i'm observing the experiences that my body is producing but who is that that is observing those experiences so the problems and challenges and and excitements that arise from emotions and in, and arise from the bodies are really only problems 
to the extent that they're arising to somebody that identifies with them. So as Gary was saying, it all goes to the same place. If we can disentangle our identification with this one who is having the emotional response uh, that is uncomfortable or is having the painful response that we're turning into suffering, then really the body just unfolds on its own and it has pain and it has pleasure and it is well and it is sick. And it is, by the way, it is well more often than is sick when we seem to engage in this practice, then those emotions and those uh, um, bodily challenges really kind of get untied like knots one by one by one. Because each time, it, I, I'm sorry that it is boring, but the question is the same. To whom is this bodily challenge arising? To whom is this emotional uh, attachment occurring? And if we don't just ask that, but we really look, you know, it's like there's a pearl at the bottom uh, of the ocean and we're not just saying, oh, I think there's a pearl down there. We want to get it, right? We, and, and we're willing to hold our breath and go down there. We're willing to get still and take our awareness and look our awareness back at ourselves and really look and say, okay, you know, who who thinks he's going to die? Who thinks she's going to die? Who is that? Uh, and so to really be with that is not something that anybody else can do for us. And so that's one of the reasons why we tend to avoid it probably because we'd rather have, have that something, that, you know, it's not something that we wish to encounter, but, we inflate the fear associated with this encounter. It's really quite simple. And this is why it's good to begin this practice with positive emotions and positive experiences. So when Ivan is eating a particularly delicious meal, you can say, wow, you know, who really loves this shrimp and really be with that experience. And you'll also find that that intensifies the experience. And when you start getting in the habit of doing that all the time, you know, Gary knows the neuroscience better than I do, but the brain seems to learn that there is no such being. <laughs> At least there is no such unified being because there's so many of them, you know, there's the one that's afraid of roller skating. There's the one, you know, and so then as you see each one, it is deconstructed as being the one. And what's interesting is that behind that, behind each one of these ad hoc selves, there's something else. And those ad hoc selves were getting in the way of us experiencing the something else. And so, and then we all use our own label for what that something else is, but it's beautiful, it's sweet, it's infinite. It's that love that Raphael was speaking to before. So uh, thoughts are just the, the means. They're, they're not uh, the entirety of the path. This is very, th these, these thoughts lead to the heart. Yeah, just two other quick things. You might also watch and see what an emotion turns into. You know, watch an emotion, just let it ride its way on yeah. through and see what happens to the emotion. See if the emotion doesn't turn into a thought. If you get very present, you can actually watch this thing like this lake. I put a lake here in our background. You watch the surface of that lake get disturbed. You can watch a an emotion start to manifest. You can actually feel it start to become a real emotion. And if you just step back and let it go, it can go all the way through. You can actually watch it form into a, a thought, a nascent thought. A thought happens up. You can watch the story come along. The thought grabs the story, and you turn it into a whole conflagration of thoughts. So they just build each other all the way up. So you can watch that process. They're all the same thing. You can, you can get it all from the thoughts. You can just deconstruct it. Second thing is, Rich touched on this one, a slightly different flip is, you can't both be subject and object. Exactly. You can objectify, you can look at this hand, and you can say, 
this hand is out there and I'm back here. I can see that as an object. I can perceive it. I can characterize it. I don't know how it works. I can't see or feel inside it, but it clearly isn't me because I can objectify it. And I have to be back here as a subject. I can't be both of these things. You can go through the whole body, pieces and parts. You can do emotions, sensations, whatever you want. And you can recognize you are a subject that is perceiving these things as objects. And you are discrete from them. So you cannot be them. You can take it that way as well. It's really amazing. Like, this was uh, Shankara's teaching of in you know, early Vedanta. And it really is so simple and so powerful. It's simply look at the subject, not the object, and to really do it enough to be convinced, well, I'm looking at this computer, but I'm not this computer. What am I? And I, and I look back and you, you do that enough and you relearn the distinction between the, obser- the, the observing awareness and those objects that the observing awareness are is beholding, and it, it it it's tempting for us to conflate the two and say, oh well, you know, if I hit Gary in the hand, Gary can say, why did you hit me, yeah. right? But that's just language. Like I I I can't hit Gary, right? You know, I can hit Gary's hand, but then when we start to get close on, you know, it might sound silly, but Gary is not his hand, okay? Right. Yeah. And so you start to really exercise that feeling of like, oh, well, I'm not my, I really am not my body. I'm not just, den- I, I'm certainly not denying my body. I care for my body in a, you know, ongoing way, but I'm not it any more than I'm my bicycle. So um, that's a really t- quite extraordinary uh, practice, the, the twofold practice of inquiring of, you know, into the eye, who is this eye? And where did this idea that the I is this body come from? It's a very, it it probably seems like a silly question at this point to some people, but go with it. Wow, thank you guys. I have a question that's kind of in a similar vein, uh, and it's being asked anonymously. And so I'll read it. Uh, When I ask who am I, it brings me back to realizing that I'm the observer. Mm -hmm. I do not have any analysis, just, oh, yes, I'm the one that experiences being alive. Mm -hmm. Am I on the right track? Yeah, but I I, I mean, I I don't like who am I. I mean, uh, who am I, I find to be a little more complicated to work with than things like where am I or when am I, uh, because they aren't so equivocal. I mean, who am I can be an existential observation and analysis can go on forever. But yes, if it you know turns you back to this, I am this observing subject, then it's done its job. Uh, one question I get a lot is people say, I'm doing this self-inquiry, but the problem is I do it and I just get this still space. You know, I, I, there should be something more there. Well, that's the answer. The still space is the answer. You ask, where am I? And the brain runs around frantically looking for where you are, can't find an answer and just says, I don't know. And it's, they're quiet. And so that's the answer. You aren't any place. When you say, when am I, the same thing happens. Or if you can hold, who am I, without it going into intellectual, the same thing happens. I mean, the answer is the same every time. It's a blank space there because there isn't any I. It's just an ad hoc avatar program we're running that's just here and there, here and there, here and there. It's not there all the time. It comes and goes. It sweeps across the brain as frequencies sweep across the cortex. It's made up and then goes away each time we have an activity. A new function arises. A new arrangement of centers is involved in that eye. It changes continuously. There is no eye. And that's the answer that you got back from who am I? You're just this observing presence. And and really, I would say uh, it does sound like you're on the right track, but be with what is it? What is the feeling that occurs when you realize that you're the observing subject? Is that is that just an answer that you kind of come to in order to be done, or is there the being of being the observing subject and who, who is not, you know, the object? And that's where then you can also 
in order to experiment with that feeling, as Gary's saying, and say, and when and am I? And where am I? Right? And who cares? Right? You know, all the various versions of inquiring into whoever this observing uh, subject is can keep you from just saying, oh, I know who that is. That's the observer. Okay, now I'm done. Because that's, the, to me, the beginning of the treasure hunt is that you're saying, ah, okay, I can get back here. Now, what's it like back here? What happens when I dwell here? What This is my true self. What happens when I abide in this as opposed to abiding in that which made me ask who I am? And then the more you abide in that, the more you've basically, you know, dissolved into it. And it, <laughs> and it gets very subtle. Yeah. I mean, the further along you go, as Rich is touching on, the further along you go, the more subtle it becomes, the less concrete you feel your way back into this observing presence. And you're there as a subject and just feel you're like you're going back into a cave. Mm -hmm. and you're trying to feel what the cave's like and you try to feel for just something back there that's concrete. You keep looking around the inside of the cave and you can't find anything that's really concrete. You just keep doing that and keep watching and it gets more and more subtle. And the, the brain begins to recognize, look, this eye doesn't exist. We don't need this thing. We're functioning perfectly well without it, thank you very much. We don't need that eye and we can't find it anyway. And feel it, like Rich was saying, feel what the eye feels like when you're having an emotion and feel what it feels like when it's it's smaller and smaller and weaker and weaker. Feel what happens to that concretion, that collapse in consciousness that's around that eye. And just go into it and see it fade away. And you'll be able to tell if if the answer that you have to yourself is like, oh, I am that observing subject. You can feel like if that's a kind of cutting off or that 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 collapse, that concretion that, that Gary was talking about, if it's a kind of if, if it's a separation, you can feel what that feels like. You, you know, it's it's a kind of severing. Whereas if you feel this kind of uh, really sweet, undulating stillness that just you want to inquire into more and more and more and kind of explore what it's like being that, then you're not stopping, you know, the ship, you're not collapsing it into that little egoic separated being. And it, after a while, there's no mistaking the two. You know, it would be like, you know, uh, make, take, mistaking salty and sweet. You know, they're just, they're completely different feelings. And so it's learning to identify the feeling associated with the I that really allows you to then explore more of the treasure of awareness. Because as soon as it comes up, you feel it and you go, oh, wait a minute, what's that doing here? And then you go back further and you're you're in the, you know, the luscious milkshake of pure consciousness. <laughs> I can call it that. So, so yes, it sounds like you're on the right track, but uh, there, there are some alternative strategies. I was quickly writing down the luscious milkshake of consciousness. <laughs> it's just so yummy. I don't know how else to. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you to the person who asked that question. Uh, they did remark privately to me that they're experiencing still space during this uh, inquiry, so I think that is the right track from what you guys are saying. Yeah. Um, thank you, and uh, I'm going to go to another question, if that's okay, uh, from Diane, who asks, and I'm going to try to get this correct with the right commas because they're important, what is the relationship between the stillness that is not a state and not knowing in regards to concepts and language. Mm. Is it more along the lines of not knowing what I is? The I is in quotes. Right. Um, well, wonderful treatise on this from the 14th century is The Cloud of Unknowing uh, by a Christian contemplative, essentially writing a meditation manual. Um, the, the short answer I would say is that not knowing is the technique like we concepts or and and labels and language are so persuasive and so apparently useful to us that we become 
become convinced that they are so. We think that they are truth. And we need to uh, release those concepts if we're to experience what brings them into being and what sh- that which they are just maps of. And so, for example, uh, not just conceptually not knowing what the I is, but observing the reality of your own awareness and seeing, for lack of a better perceptual term, that there is no I there. We're giving the brain, as Gary was saying, evidence and data that it can see that there is no I there. Then that is the sort of genuine not knowing which is a knowing because now you know that there's no uh, I there. It's not just a concept. It's not just something that you read in a book. It's not something that you just know is theoretically impossible. You yourself have observed it over and over and over again. And your awareness has integrated that into its own mode of operation. So I think, again, just like to recap what I think the question was asking, because it was, you know, an interesting question that not knowing is a way of sort of unraveling our dependence on what it is that we think we know, concepts, labels, language, but that behind that is the sweet still space that is masked by the mapping procedures that we use to try to uh, um, kind of control that awareness and point it in directions associated with the eye. So I, I, if there, if I wonder if that answers the question. If it does, great. If not, good follow up, Gary. You have something. Yeah, another way to to get at this is the classical Zen saying that's really only don't know. I mean, there is this uh, feeling that you get when you think you know something. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I know what's going to happen tomorrow, or I know what chocolate tastes like, or I I know what's going to happen to my future. And that knowing, you can feel internally what that feels like to have that knowing in you. There is an I that holds that. We've talked a lot about inquiry tonight. But you can get your really tactile teeth into this, I know something. I know this philosophy. I know the answer to this. I know Schopenhauer, whatever. But you can see how much of that there's an egoic investor, an owner of that, I, my, I know this. Feel your way into that feeling of this sense of knowing something and see what it would be like if you didn't know anything. If there was nothing that you were sure of, nothing. You were completely not closed out on knowing. Because my experience, I've almost, I've never been accurate in saying I know something. There was always something more to it. I was grabbing hold of it prematurely. And just feel your way back into this idea of don't know really don't know on the deepest, fundamental, most complete level, you really don't have any idea. The information you have about the world is incomplete, about your relationship is incomplete, about the certainties in your life, your philosophies are incomplete. You really don't know. See if you can come to that place of only not knowing, where there's nobody hanging on to being a knower. And what's interesting about how you're putting that even right now, Gary, is that it it it's it's a it's very beautifully paired with self inquiry mm-hmm. because then you say well who's bothered by that <laughs> who, who wants to know as it were mm-hmm. uh, and it's really true it's it's just like as we were saying before you can feel when there's that collapse and it, it, it's that it, it's one of its best signatures is in that moment of like oh I know this one. Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you guys for that. And thank you for the, the question, Diane. And if you want to uh, reply, I know you're making some, you've made a couple replies saying mapping procedures, which is a great expression. And I agree. Uh, really, really cool answer, you guys. Thank you. Um, I have another question. I'm going to move on. Oh, and Diane says, excellent. Thank you, guys. Uh, I have another question from Carrie, a.k.a. Lucy. <laughs> is the practice of consciousness expansion the same as ego dissolution? No. I don't think you can expand consciousness. I think you can get rid of your ego, 
I mean, the, the consciousness we talk about is ever present. You know, it's it's, it's in the Bhagavad Gita. I mean, it is, is what is there all the time, unchanging against this changing world we have in front of it. So I don't. As you get rid of the ego, my experience, you just reveal what's already there, which is this enormous, manifest, unbelievably, you know, almost incomprehensible stillness and consciousness. A universal consciousness. I don't think you can go, you can go out there and expand consciousness. I mean, you're the one that's collapsing consciousness. As long as you're the ego there, you're the one holding consciousness back, but doesn't need you to be anything. You get out of the way, consciousness is already there. You know, ego dissolution will give you consciousness, but you can't expand consciousness, is my experience. And and so expanded consciousness uh, is even to use the earlier terminology, the mapping procedure of the ego as it starts to experience its own dissolution. In other words, that, wow, consciousness seems so much bigger than it did when I was always collapsing it into this way. But as Gary's saying, the consciousness isn't being expanded. That's just the ego's impression that it's being expanded from its point of view. So I think that's why we have that metaphor of consciousness expansion, because it's being told from the point of view of, uh, of the ego. And this is like Aldous Huxley talked about the reducing valve of consciousness and opening up reducing valve of consciousness. But consciousness is, is already there. It's, it's not being expanded. And your consciousness can't be expanded. It's a little bit like that uh, oxymoron of holding on to love, right? As long as you have consciousness, it won't expand because it's too big to fit in the little nodule that we have as a premise of our eye. That makes sense. However, if you want to experience what people call expanded consciousness, whether the ego. Right on, thank you. Carrie says, thank you that answer. Um, so I'm going to go to the next question, if that's cool. Uh, Esteban asks, both Gary and Rich are writers, researchers, and teachers. So how can we learn to just be examples of or doers of non-dual teaching in a classroom or online or non-dual re researchers picking topics to write about and investigate deeply? Do Rich or Gary have surprises worth sharing on how they taught how they taught, write, and researched in ways unplanned or planned in ways that worked out in interesting ways. Talk about your teaching. Yeah, I don't, the, the, you know, I, when I first started, uh, I was first trained uh, as a writing instructor uh, at, at, in California in the late 80s. And I would get so worked up, uh, you know, I don't think it's too much information to say, you know, that for, seven or eight years of being a teacher, I would throw up before every class that I taught because I was so worked up in trying to do the impossible, which was to control what was going to happen. And uh, I wasn't a very well-organized teacher, and I uh, would just somehow try to make it work with that teaching. And But after a while, I, you know, I started to notice and students started to notice that it was when I was letting go of this kind of idea that I had any plan or uh, ability to control what was going to be going on in the classroom that teaching would actually occur. And the process of just becoming more and more comfortable with the fact that there is no I here doing the teaching there is just consciousness manifesting, you know, in the classroom in the form of teachers and students, the more the kind of most totally miraculous episodes of pedagogy and learning just happen in a completely ongoing basis. Um, now I no longer prepare at all before I go in and teach large lecture classes and as I enter the class, I just write three things on the board that manifest through me, 
And I speak about those three things that are in a relationship to a set of readings that we have done. So I actually, you know, I think it's the only real creativity and learning that takes place and that uh, and certainly in my own experience, and then our pedagogy and our curriculum is des designed around exactly the opposite, um, you know, kind of premise. So a couple of months ago, I met with somebody who was a curricular designer. And I said, well, you know, what if I said that I seem to like contradictions in terms tonight? And I said, what if, what if I said that was a total contradiction in term to design a curriculum? You can't, and she was, you know, aghast. But this is the premise of all of our education. And to me, this explains a great deal about like why there's so much suffering and so much misunderstanding, right? That, you know, even for example, and I don't wish to go on so long about this, but this is coming up uh, that for example, I, you know, we will see in response to the still traumatic, widespread, total misunderstanding of racism and each other, we will see curricula based on understanding racism put into our classrooms and so forth. And what won't happen is a letting go where enough dialogue can emerge from students and with teachers and with students among themselves where they can let go of the very mapping procedures and labels and so forth that are racism. And instead, what will happen is we're taught about how we're not supposed to speak or supposed to speak. And this capacity to let go and love and to notice that the most common word Martin Luther King used in his theology was agape, the experience of selflessness, this non-dual state that Gary and I are talking about, um, that is what has to occur for learning to take place. But the egoic structure of the curriculum that is associated with it is so, it doesn't believe in it. It doesn't believe that that actually exists. And so it thinks it's completely insane to go into a classroom without having everything planned out. But, you know, like if you look at... Uh, say, Gary, in my video about uh, free will and determinism, it's at least as equally insane to think you know what's going to happen in that classroom over the course of a half hour. So I think what it really speaks to is what people are, you know, uh, uh, you know, practiced in, and, and we can very much become practiced in sufficiently letting go that we can allow the cosmos to speak through us and not try to get in, get in its way and say what it is it's going to say. I had a blog post on a nice research study that was done in Scandinavia on you don't think up what you say. And we can scientifically prove that you don't think up what you say, literally. So all this angst we have about are we going to say the right thing or not is silly because you won't know anyway. If you watch very carefully after you say something, you don't Prepare that when you're with your friends. It just comes out of no place. And you very quickly run in after that, listen to it, and try to make up a story about what you just said. You don't think up what you say. And so we are so trapped into believing if we can just script the whole thing out, we won't say anything stupid. But in fact, you do say stupid things. And you have no control over them. They just manifest. And you say, what did I say there? And you try to make up a story afterwards. If you watch after you meet with somebody that's more important, that's very important, you may find yourself getting a, a recap of key things you said and key things they responded to. You don't ask for it, it just suddenly pops up there. That's evolutionarily developed. So in case we made a mistake talking to somebody up in the hierarchy over us, we could go back and fix it. Because you don't know what you say. And if you begin to trust that process, and Rich is wonderful at this thing, just trust that process that you don't know what's going to happen. All of our dialogues, we've got almost 50 of them now, are, are completely unrehearsed, totally spontaneous. We don't have a clue what we're going to say when we sit down. Not the foggiest clue. And like tonight, edited, really. no clue. There's yeah. no editing. There's nothing. That's exactly unvarnished what comes out. 
And you can do the same thing. I did it in business. I did it in healthcare. I did it in the military. You can do this all the time, any place, no matter where you are. If you have a like a big business meeting, you read the exhibits ahead of time. So you know the background material. Rich knows the Bible inside and out. So you have some preparation when you go there. But then you let whatever manifests, manifest. You let it come out of no place. And it's much better than you could think up yourself ahead of time. Much better. And it really fits the situation. I mean, if you're a good classroom teacher, you look at the people. You can read them or even giving a presentation to conference something. You can read those people. You can see if they're getting it or not getting it. If, if this, this person gets it, doesn't get it. You can get a sense of that. That can feedback very quickly. You can Those things can change what comes out. You just are responding to the energy of the moment. You feel the class. You feel what's going on and let that dictate it. Don't try to script it. Just let it come out. You'll be much, much better off than if you try to script it. Right. And and it works so perfectly even given the previous question because my introductory lectures are always on on not knowing the Bible. Like the, the task of the class in this particular class about the Bible is to not know the Bible, that the problem is thinking you know what the Bible has to say. And this need not be confined to the classroom, you know. Uh, if you were in sales in particular, that would seem to be a golden opportunity to really just like let go of what you think the client wants or what you want the client to want and just be with the situation. Uh, and you're going to necessar- of necessity form a bond. I was in a conversation with a doctor today in a doctor's office and I just was let go into the conversation and it created a very interesting outcome. So it it, it, it never fails to get out of our own way. Wow. Thank you for that. I mean, it's just so amazing because I know, I mean, I feel that's, that is how you're, you're giving these lectures. They're not lectures, these mm-hmm. talks and stuff just, in channeling almost, but yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, thank you. But we all uh, do it. We're, that's what we're all doing all the time, but we don't trust it enough. Mm. And it's also this idea like, well, my job requires that I prepare before, you know, yes. there's this idea of what you're supposed to do. Um, yes, which is almost never correct. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, great. So I have a, Another question, just going to keep rolling here. Um, Mark asks a question for both Rich and Gary. Even though I know the oneness of everything is so much bigger than words, I'd still love to hear their take on it. That's my answer. (laughs) (laughs) I also gave my answer, which was laughter. Um, How about, you know, I mean, because that's what poetry is, right? Poetry is the attempt to respond to, you know, this unmappable domain. And, you know, it brings words about that can sort of resonate with what it is. And, you know, it's it's this joyous, weird, continually unfolding adventure. You know, it's, it's a nonstop, you know, laugh track and learning curve you know, all wrapped into one. And so the oneness is not the the end of all things. It's the sort of continuous teaching cycle of all things. I never cease to stop fathoming the oneness. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you, if I had some advice, forget about trying to imagine what it's going to be like. I had read a lot I had meditated a lot. I was totally unprepared and totally had no idea what it was going to be like, what it actually was. So don't, you know, believe that somehow you're going to map out, uh, work your way into fabricating this process by understanding what it's like. It's like, you know, how does a rose smell? Mm -hmm. How does chocolate taste? No matter what you, what does sex feel like? No matter what you do, you can't, accurately even come close to replicating the experience itself this is just like that even more so you have no idea just go ahead do it forget about trying to map it understand it plan it ahead of time it's not going to work this is something that is transcendent it transcends your mind's ability to grasp it 
That's why it's so special. Just let it go and just do the practices and it'll come to you. Just do the practices. Agreed, because, you know, the particularly delicious cosmic joke that I felt was played on myself was that I, you know, had read widely in philosophical traditions and I was utterly and totally convinced that this was that conceptually impossible, that oneness was a kind of like mirage, you know, that, that people were hallucinating into onto the pages of philosophy. And then so to experience it unmistakably in a way that was not the description that was given philosophically and so forth was just like, I'm still laughing at, you know, at this phenomenon, but, you know, because again, that's the not knowing. I thought I knew, I very much did not. And there was a delicious joke on me and that joke was oneness. Wonderful. Thank you guys. Uh, I have another question from D Diane who asks a uh, question. The GPS locator for the body to orient it in space is sort of like an image in consciousness that is like a thought slash image. It is a concept the eye attaches to. Does this map need to be inquired into and let go eventually? The, G uh, the GPS locator, it's a fascinating thing reading a book now uh, from a neuroscientist at uh, Penn who tried to find out how we generate a mystical experience. And there is a part of the brain, the parietal cortex, that actually does give us this sensation of being something in time and space. And uh, if we can somehow uh, occlude the functioning of that parietal cortex, which sits, sits like right in here, right in here, uh, then you completely lose a GPS locator. Uh, you, you can't orient yourself even walking across the room or lying down on the bed. Uh, people, some people have had this malady, and they go towards the bed. They can't even move towards the bed. They can't orient themselves in the room. They end up crawling on the floor. Uh, they can't find out how to even get onto the bed. Uh, so there is that function in the brain that does that ability. Uh, it's not the philosophical part, but actually does physically create this sense of you, of you being an existent thing discrete from the furniture, and yet somehow able to map moving across space to get into that piece of furniture. And if you lose that, then you've lost your GPS locator. Uh, but there is another twist on this question, the traditional, quest, the traditional uh, twist on it is to say that, you know, there is something that keeps you from bumping into furniture. It's basically this parietal cortex, and we need to keep that operating. But it's not an eye that has to do it. I mean, the, the brain can do this all by itself. Thank God we don't have to go up there and tell it what it has to do to orient ourselves in space, time, in this room. We couldn't do it. So we aren't necessary to do that, but the brain has that functional capability to do that GPS location all by itself without us being there. I experienced this recently because uh, I had a bicycle crash, okay. and it happened so quickly that uh, a sport utility vehicle pulled out from a, a side street as I was going about 20 miles an hour on a bicycle and my body, I didn't think the, I didn't say now I will move my body to the right. My body just automatically turned its dominant side, my right side, to my shoulder and my back, to take the brunt of the impact in the car without any thoughts ever and it just occurred and took all of the impact on my right side of my body and my ribs which was the smart thing to do but there was no thought associated with that and i think if you looked neuroscientifically if there was a way to uh track there would be nothing emerging from the default mode network that was said do this now because that would have been too slow i would already been over the hood of the uh car at that point and so uh, what's interesting is that I think that as we become more actually attuned to our bodies, as we realize that we are not them, right? In other words, that the mistake that we are our bodies creates all kinds of confusion and inability to really look directly at our physical selves and care for it. Um, that when, when we're less confused about our identification with our body, and we can more experience embodiment 
as you know sort of something that we're participating in rather than something that we are then all kinds of noise falls away and in fact we're more attuned probably to where we are in that gps locator and so forth right like if you're a dancer i really doubt that it's the thinking capacity of the eye that is keeping you on point and in pose in exactly the right way where you should be nor is it the thinking capacity of the eye that's telling the fingers where to go on the piano when you're playing the piano. So, um, you know, I do think, though, that it's very interesting that space and time themselves become experienced differently, as Gary was saying, as that default no mode network and other uh, processes begin to decline in association with the eye that, you know, I don't have any problem, you know, getting into my bed, but there is a kind of uncanny continuity between all things that I hadn't experienced before, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, I, yeah. and also at the, maybe it's the ballet dancing thing and the, the biking thing, is this now, now, now. Yeah. People don't understand what now, now, now means uh, you can't be here now, the famous book, because you're somebody being here now. It doesn't. It's not that way. If you're now, 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 there's nothing, there's no other track, parallel track going on that you're running at the same time. You're only now. And that's a much more pregnant and potent place than what you might think. It's not just the intersection between past and future. It really is a whole different kind of a feeling. We're back to talking about what oneness is like. Now is is like that. Now is complete, total, this very second. And now, and now, and now, and now. And if you're in that, there is no need for a GPS look at You are so present for the current moment, everything takes place seamlessly. And if you come out of that, Rich and I have talked about this before, you immediately become klutzified. I mean, if you come out of now, now, now into, oh, what am I doing here? Then, then you get really... Uh, not tuned in. It's an it's a very different feeling between those two things, uh, but it really is getting rid of anything else going on in your consciousness to perturb you from being fully present for what's happening in the present moment. Thank you for that. Wow, uh, just trying to keep up with a lot of questions coming in here. We have a few more minutes left, so I'm going to try to get to as many as we can. Gary, what was the name of the book that you mentioned at the beginning of answering this question that you're reading? Oh, um, my God. What, yeah, what, what, why God Won't Go Away. Uh, it's a, you got the pen. I can't think of his name right now. Oh, I got the book. I'll get the book. Yeah. Oh. Okay, cool. Thank you. The answer uh, is not because it's God. <laughs> What was that? Say it again. The answer to why won't God go away is not because it's God. <laughs> That's, <laughs> yeah. It's a one pager. <laughs> this is book, and it's, it's a little dated as far as the neuroscience. It's basically 2001. He has a, a more recent book out, 2010, but I think it's a crappy book. Uh, this one's really useful. Uh, a lot of stuff on, on, on how come we have mysticism. Where did mysticism come from? Why do we have this feeling and no other species appears to have it? Why did we why did we create God or why does God create us in this way? And it's not a religious book. Uh, one guy's an agnostic or two co-authors. One guy's agnostic, one guy's an atheist. Uh, hardcore science may do a nice uh, kind of first clean look job at, at why we're mystical and how those experiences uh, came about evolutionarily and why we developed them and why we have this belief. There's no other species that goes around uh, building huge buildings to their gods. I mean, we, we were, <laughs> the Easter Island is a famous story. Uh, the Easter Islanders actually stripped their island bare of all logs so they could roll their enormous pieces of stone over and make their gods uh, piled up like Stonehenge. They, they made the island uninhabitable just to make sure they were honoring their gods. No other species does that. Chimpanzees don't do it. The great apes don't do it. No other species does that. Why do we do that as a species? Because we want, we want to point to a cause for the non-dual state. 
Yes, and it may, it may be that. You know, well, why did we evolve this ability to have this mystical experience? It came out of sex, most likely. But whether whether sex actually came in uh, to you know push the evolutionary genetics forward, or whether it created mysticism, or it just hijacked that same capability that was going for this self reflection. But it came about somehow linked into sex. But now it looks like the mystical state, as we've been finding out and talking about, has actually surpasses sex. I mean, it actually is beyond sex. So it shouldn't be if it was just evolutionarily to support sexual selection that it would stop at sex. But it's actually gone past it. So it's become you know, counter to sex. So it really is a fascinating thing to get into if you want, if you're so so inclined. But a good neuroscientific look at mysticism, ritual, religion, uh, how they came about evolutionarily. Great, thank you. We had a couple questions about the book, so thank you for that and for your honesty about uh, your readings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we have time for one more question. If that's if that's cool, you guys. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Ivan asks, I've read that on the non-dual path, there is a certain point at which the self slash ego is so completely seen through that it just cannot be believed in again, similarly to how you cannot will yourself to believe in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. Doesn't that prove there are certain milestones and cross lines that once you cross, you can't really go back? I, I don't like milestones. Uh, the reason I don't like them is pedagogically, uh, they can be a train wreck. I've watched some lineages that put in milestones and pass out white belts and yellow belts and green belts and black belts for different levels of awakening. And it creates all kinds of mischief, all kinds of exploitation. Uh, I mean, uh, my experience, people unfold differently in different ways. I think it's naive to believe that we're so different genetically. We're so different our backgrounds and our histories and our friends and where we were born, who we were born to and when we were born, that it's kind of foolish to believe we're all going to go on exactly the same path at the same rate through the same individual experiences. Uh, there may, there's some similarities, but there are many, many, many differences. At the end, there is a common experience across all the mystical traditions and across all the religions, but the path of getting there can be highly varied. So I don't, I don't find, uh, milestones useful. But yes, it does happen along the way. There is a place at which many people that I've worked with have come to me and said, look, I don't coach this in. They say, look, I get this strange feeling. I'm not in charge anymore. That in fact, something else is, is driving the bus or running the show. And it's his. I mean, the brain has taken over, recognized that the I is really just an avatar. It's just a software, a piece of software that evolutionarily we need to select out or work around or give it a different priority, but it's not really going to be around much longer. It's not that useful. I mean, the, the brain sees through this. I mean, you, the ego, don't see through this. The brain sees through this avatar and begins slowly moving it off to the side of the desktop or maybe down into a file folder someplace. And it's true that the, the unseeing of it is impossible. You know, once you've seen through it, <laughs> that you, you can't go back and believe it. So there is the line from the Gita, you know, Nivartante Tadama Paramama, you know, never to return. But, but I, you know, I, I think what Gary's pointing to pedagogically also is that sometimes we can have an experience and then we think we don't need to practice or we think that we're done or, and, and that often leads to like really big problems because then people regress uh whereas if you can take it as a sign of like of the accuracy of the observation i'm like yeah that's right like it's not just a conceptual phenomenon actually that eye doesn't exist like you know i'm i'm, I'm seeing that it's not there and the abiding with that experience of this uh, of the eye not being there then that's really what matters um and you know as Gary was saying, we're, we're so diverse, you know, I doubt anything can ever be proved about any path, you know, univocally, you know, that because each of us are uniquely coming into this experience. That's part of the fun. Thank you so much. If you have any closing words, um, 
but just about at the end time here. Well, I would say that, again, just to uh, redouble the idea that a lot of times it would appear to be the case that people don't believe that this, that anything besides the ego exists. So if we say, you know, you don't make up what you say, then people are sort of incredulous and they think that there's some sort of metaphysics being invoked, you know, that some other entity you know, maybe a diabolical one is saying what's uh, uh, being said. But in fact, exactly the opposite is the case. It's the metaphysics of everyday life that assume that there is this weird homunculus I that's making up everything and whose fault it is and who's so great and who's so horrible at the same time, this ego. That's the real weird thing that should be wondered at. You know, I mean... Aliens may exist, aliens may not exist, but the I most definitely does not. And it's just so weird that we have a hard time believing in that which brings the I into being, which is this experience of consciousness that any of us can have at the drop of a moment. We can have that experience. All we have to do is wonder where the I comes from and really wonder actively, you know, Gary and I, before the, the webinar, we're talking about the comparing, like, you know, amphibians going up onto land, which is really just a continuity of evolution, finding a different space with uh, resources. Whereas the, the moment of human of consciousness looking back and wondering where it comes from, which is really the evolutionary moment, is so radical and beautiful and wonderful that we just want everybody to get the chance to participate in it because it's where we're at. It's where we're at as a species and it's where we're at as individual suffering beings. And you know, something else Rich and I talk about a lot is it really is that simple. And I've got several people, a couple of work in Scandinavia right now that say, I can't believe it's this simple. There's nothing to this. It's really so simple, so obvious. How did I miss this thing? It is just that easy. We want to make a complicated philosophy out of it. We make a lot of metaphysics out of it. It isn't that hard. This is really direct, simple, self-inquiry, surrender, letting go, and it happens. It's that simple. And just persevere at it. Just keep on keeping on. Word. Well, such such uh, wonderful words of encouragement to end upon, and thank you both, Rich and Gary, for for all of your your words tonight. They were amazing, and for your silence as well. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer and Chris. Thank you for all the questioners and all of the people who logged on, and everybody who's going to be watching this at some present moment. Thank you, guys. And thank you to those questions you gathered ahead of time. And we'll be uh, sharing the recording in the next couple of days. So those folks will hopefully see the see and hear the answers. So again, thank you, everyone. We'll be sending that out to you. And I, we put in the chat two links, one to our contribution page. If you, if you got something out of this tonight, we'd appreciate if you could give what you can to help pay for the costs. That would be wonderful. Every little bit helps. And we also put a link the Amazon link to the book from Rich and Gary that was uh, that came about from these dialogues and from their ongoing dialogues and their YouTube sessions and just all their conversations. So that link is on there uh, into stillness dialogues. And I think there's a subtitle that I just missed. What's the full title, I'm you guys? Beyond thought. Okay, there we go. So that's there in the link, and hopefully you guys can check that out. So. We'll hopefully see you all soon.